Now, through all these challenges, for both men, one constant remained. Neither of them ever lost their sense of humour. They were both supported by wonderful wives, and they never lost their dedication to the party, to their families, or to the deep friendship and respect they developed for one another. So together, ladies and gentlemen, I suggest that they have both set an example which should inspire us all. But I now call on Shirley McCarrow to make a presentation on behalf of the John McEwen House Board. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I'm not going to add to that. What happens in John McEwen House stays in John McEwen House. <laughs> say a few words. Well, thank you very much, Shirley. And ladies and gentlemen, all of the National Party. Well, it's a, a great thrill for me to be here today. I've run across many colleagues that I've known over the years, and to be able to come down and meet you all is great. I really came down here too because I knew Shirley was going to, um, was, well, tie back a bit from her job in the McEwen House and that's one of the reasons why we're all together and we wish her well in her partial retirement, only partial because she's going to continue on doing some work for us. Um, you know, as you get older, I suppose more rust gets on you. But you do still have a good memory and you build up a greater memory of history. But getting back to McEwen House, I can remember as if it was last night, John McEwen coming along to the billiard room. There were about four or five of us. Peter was one of them there. Uh, John England, and Mac Halton, and what we used to do then, because Parliament used to go on till about five o'clock in the morning, we'd go up there and play uh, Russian, Russian pool. pool was our favourite one, and we would play. And on this particular night, about three o'clock in the morning, John McEwen turned up, and he wasn't usually down there, but he came down and he had a few beers with us, and he, he talked about the idea that we ought to have a national secretariat. He said, the Liberal Party have got Menzies, the Labor Party have a big, we have nothing. But it's going to take a lot of effort to get a secretariat going. And amongst us there, and then a few more turned up, we started working on trying to raise funds to get them a house going. But it was going to cost us a lot of money and we just, as a party, didn't have any money. I suppose, as time went on, I then became a minister, so I had to leave the group who was working hard, Peter was one of them, to have a national headquarters. But while I became a minister, I was minister for interior, and that had complete control of Canberra as well as many other things. And I then used my influence to find a good spot for the National Party. <laughs> and that's how we got our site just across the road from the Courage Young Hotel. <laughs> that's, I just plugged a point for it. But a couple of years later, I was moved on to Minister for Primary Industry and Peter Nixon came in as Minister for Interior, and he was the one who actually finally uh, got that labelled as ours and we paid for it, and the land was ours ready to go ahead. And gee, we had a lot of good members who worked hard. All sorts of functions across the country, 
and we got enough to build the first section of John McEwen House. And uh, then some years later, what was it, about 15 years later, we rebuilt it again and uh, Peter and I were a bit helpful in that too. You know, you mentioned tonight that I'm remembered for being such important people. Uh, Doug Anthony All-Stars, everybody remembers me for that. <laughs> <laughs> and up in my electorate area, the only thing they remember me for is governing the country from a caravan during the Christmas period. <laughs> So, you know, it's not hard to be important once you get into it. <laughs> My political life is a unique one. It, 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 quite unique. I said I knew so many prime ministers, but it was unique because my father was before me, and then I came along, and Larry came along. And we all represented the one electorate in Australia. Nobody else in Australia has that record, and I don't think anybody will ever have it. But we enjoyed our life as politics. It was hard for me because I was just married, Margot was having her first child, and we had no money. And we had to scramble through, and people don't realise how hard it is on young politicians to uh, initially get started. You know, in those days, we got no car allowance in electric. We only got one telephone electric. We had no uh, electoral secretary. So doing all these things was a struggle. But as the years go by, I think I've had a, a remarkable career and I've enjoyed every bit of it. And I would never have been able to do that if I hadn't had the support of the National Party Mind you, it was a country party then. And if I could just bring this section in, after the Whitlam defeated us in 1972, I decided that the party had to work harder, had to expand itself. And so I <coughs> got the secretariat, one or two people there, to send out notices to every country party branch in Australia, and there were about 1,400 branches. And on that, we asked them if they would fill in this form, which had a lot of questions on it. And it was a great thing for the party. They had these meetings everywhere. And from the answering of these forms, I realised that a lot of people were unsure of having the country party as its name, because they came from seaside cottages and and country towns, and they felt they weren't really country party people. They, they were more than that. And so I got the Queensland Party to study this issue as to what they thought of it in Queensland. And it wasn't long before they said, yes, we want a new name. And we selected the name of the National Party because it was a name being used in New Zealand at the same time. And from then on, we had quite a few years before all the state organisations would change their name from the country party, but they have, and I think it's a good name. I'm glad to see you all here supporting it, being enthusiastic about it, and I think the principal thing of the National Party is the people who are in it are honest people with great integrity, and that's what makes a political party successful. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Keep the applause going, please, for Doug Anthony. I must say, Peter Nixon, that's, that's going to be a, a tough act to follow, but I invite you to say a few words, Peter. Oh, well, he set, a, he set a very high standard, as usual. What I'd like to do is reflect back on, on something Doug said about the raising of funds for McEwen House. Uh, John McEwen appointed Mac Halton, the member for Indi, uh, who, was not in, who was a backbencher, uh, to rally the federal members to make sure that they went back to their electorates and uh, got things going for raising funds. 
and we had such things as fat and a bullock for the party, you know, branches all through Gippsland, fat and bullocks, and we said truckloads of bullocks off. And, and, and Mac did a superb job, there's no question about that. And the second person who must be mentioned uh, is Hugh Rogers. Hugh was Federal Treasurer of the party and uh, a corporate businessman out of Melbourne. He opened so many doors and without, truly without him, the party would have been many more years, <coughs> I think, getting, the, getting McEwen House built. They should be put on the record. Sue has been one of many staff that have been given loyal service to the, to the party. She's been extraordinary. 30 years in the one job, looking after the egos of people coming and going all the time, <laughs> looking after the difficulties in the building, looking after the tenants. She's been a great servant of the party. Please give Sue another clap. And people like Sue in a party are real gems. Uh, it's called John McEwen House. John McEwen was my mentor uh, in, a, in a true political sense. When I came into, when I was about 19, I used to drive my father to conferences. And uh, on this particular day at a conference, there was some silly resolution on, and I got fired up and got to the microphone and burst into it. And the next thing I've been caught up on the stage to meet John McEwen. And John McEwen said, are you interested in politics? And I said, well, I'm interested in current affairs. Uh, you know, I'm not terribly interested in politics. I don't know much about it. And he said, uh, well, take a bit word of advice. If you ever stand for politics, don't stand for, for state politics. That's bridges and drains. <laughs> he said, he said Stand, stand for federal politics because the world is your oyster. Well, I never expected to ever stand for federal politics, but that's another story. But as my mentor, the day I was sworn in with Doug Anthony and Sinclair and Lord Casey and Harold Holt, uh, and John McEwen were there. Uh, John McEwen took me back to his office and I spent an hour with him. And I can remember many of the things he said. But one of the things he said was, if you ever mislead the House, go back, go back in and explain yourself. Well, the very, I think it was almost the very first question time that I had to get uh, Northern Territory as part of my interior portfolio. Gordon Wright asked me a question about expenditure on houses at Papunya. And I got up and gave an answer and gave a figure. And when I went down to the, my office, the red button was going on my desk and was Bob Swift, the Deputy Secretary. He said, Minister, you gave a wrong figure. You exaggerated the amount of money we're spending. And I, he told me the true figure and it wasn't much different. So I sat there all day thinking, oh, I'll let that go over the shoulder. And, uh, and then suddenly at 10 to 6, which was a time you had to go into the house to give a personal explanation, I got up off the desk and I went into the house and explained that I'd, I'd made a mistake earlier in answering a question. At eight o'clock, Gordon Bryant came down uh, asking to see the green, the Hansard green. He said, uh, and uh, I showed it to him. He said, oh, you've corrected it. He said, I had official, at four o'clock this afternoon, I got official permission from the Labor Party to move a, a motion of no confidence in you for misleading the House. Now, as a young minister, it would have been devastating to me <coughs> had I let, uh, let that happen. So that was the advice of John McEwen. He, on another occasion, and this is a beauty, I was in my first cabinet submission. I forgot what it was about. And uh, the, the procedure was that the treasurer, the, the minister introduces it, the treasurer pulls it to pieces. It goes round all the ministers. The, the treasurer has another say, and the minister has a final say. And so Gordon uh, McMahon tore strips off this thing, and um, you know I was angry about it. And then it goes round all the ministers, and they all agreed. Came back to McMahon, he tore strips off it again. So I'm sitting on the edge of the seat, ready to go. 
and, and John McEwen sitting up next to the right, the Prime Minister went like this. And I just, I collapsed in the chair and didn't say a word. And the Prime Minister said, Peter, I think you've got that. And uh, when I was walking out, John McEwen said, you might have learned something there today. You see, you can talk your way out of things if you're not careful. And I would have, <laughs> I would have so, so blown in a man, I would have so blown in a man that people like Alan Hume, who, who never liked the, the Nats, might have come back in and started to change his mind. So McEwen was a true, genuine mentor, not only of me, but many others as well. Um, the last thing I want to say is, Warren, congratulations on a great speech. Both you and John Howard gave great speeches, and it just shows why the country is very well led. I wish the conference every success. Please, please keep the applause going for Peter Nixon and Doug Anthony.